It's the ACDC Beyond the Thunder Podcast. With your host, Kurt Squire. It's time to rock. Yes, it's that time again, my friends, where we reach out to those extraordinary fans who've been influenced by this extraordinary little band by the name of ACDC. I'm your host, Kurt Squires, and this is the one and only ACDC Beyond the Thunder podcast, where we talk to notable actors, authors, athletes, politicians, professors, war heroes, you name it, all tremendously influenced by the power of ACDC's music in truly unique ways from A to Z. In this episode, we're starting with the letter Z. That's right, my colleague and good friend Greg Ferguson and I traveled to Los Angeles to visit the son of legendary musician, composer, and one of the most innovative artists of all time, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and Grammy Lifetime Achievement winner, the late, great Frank Zappa. Of course, we're talking about Dweezil Zappa. Born in 1969, his given birth name was Ian Donald Calvin Euclid Motorhead Zappa, but was legally changed to a nickname given to him by his father after his mother Gail's oddly curled pinky toe named Dweezil. Even better, Frank actually listed his religion as musician on Dweezil's birth certificate. How cool is that? Dweezil, we can't thank you enough for joining the ranks among fellow ACDC worshipers here on Beyond the Thunder. We thought it would be cool to let everyone listening know exactly where we are today. Well, we're sitting here in what is known as the Utility Muffin Research Kitchen. It's the uh, studio that my dad built. Uh, it was actually under construction in the late 70s, but fully operational probably, I think, uh, right around uh, the beginning of 1980, and the first record he did in here was the You Are What You Is record. Uh, so it's been changed a little bit uh, over the past uh, 20 years, but it's still a really great uh, location. Yeah, yeah. This is certainly an amazing piece of history to be sitting in. Not unlike Prince, Frank has got to be one of the most prolific composers in history. So I can only imagine that you are surrounded by music 24-7. What kind of tunes did you hear coming out of this studio growing up that might have influenced you, not even necessarily your father's music? Well, the thing about uh, the music that we heard at our house was it was really only my dad's music. Uh, we didn't have a record player of our own. We didn't listen to the radio. And um, so it was really whatever he was working on or whatever he was listening to recreationally. And that could have been anything from the Bulgarian Women's Choir to sea shanties or, you know, uh, some uh, modern composer. Uh, I remember plenty of times where, you know, he'd say, hey, you want to hear some Shostakovich? I'm like, all right, let's do it, <laughs> you know. But uh, it wasn't until I was 12 or 13 that I started to really hear other music. Um, and, of course, uh, ACDC was one of the first bands, you know, along with Led Zeppelin and... Ozzy Osbourne with Randy Rhodes at that time, you know, so early 80s. Um, and, um, you know, that was, that was what music was all about. It was, I, I, my father's music was always really important to me, and I loved his guitar playing, but it always seemed so complicated. And then when I heard these other things, you know, and Van Halen and all this other stuff, uh, that was complicated in its own way, but it, it had this, this powerful... Um, energy to it uh, and you know ACDC is uh, is nothing but energy I mean the, the Angus and Malcolm have this uh, this thing that's that's unique yeah I was reading where you were attempting to learn how to play guitar and your dad said something to the effect of you want to learn rock and roll then here's some ACDC albums to study is that true uh, when I was first playing, uh, and I started um, getting into other music other than my dad's music, uh, and I uh, was talking to him about ACDC, he was saying uh, that uh, he actually knew those guys, and he actually had uh, one of their records, and he, he did uh, play it for me. I, I had, uh, uh, I think, a, a cassette of, um, uh, let's see, either Back in Black or... Uh, or um, Highway to Hell, either either one was the first one that I got. But uh, um, he had been talking about 
when he first went to Australia and he saw this great band and he really wanted to sign them on his label. Um, and, uh, you know, they ended up getting signed to Atlantic, but it was ACDC. Uh, no kidding. And uh, he just thought that they were great because they always had this rock edge, but it was really uh, just a high volume version of the blues, you know, right, and Angus right. was uh, a, a player who had a lot of technical ability, but he didn't use it all the time. He played much more just in the pocket type of stuff and, and melodic classic guitar kinds of things. And, uh, uh, but when he did let loose, I mean, it, it's pretty impressive. His, uh, his, his sense of rhythm and his, his phrasing um, is, is what really sets him apart. Probably the most important thing about his playing is his vibrato. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so fast, but it's not wide. It's like he bends it right up to pitch and then just shakes it there. And I cannot, for the life of me, copy that because it's just it's too, it's too weird. I don't know how he does it, you know. Uh, but you always know it's Angus because, right. and he bends it in tune. That's the other thing. I, do, I don't know how they play their stuff so in tune. Angus and Malcolm, their rhythm stuff, you know, I have plenty of guitars, uh, and you go from a G chord to a D chord, and there's usually some sort of tuning issue. But for them, it always sounds good. I don't know how they do it, but <laughs> it's good. They do it. So your father sits you down to listen to this little-known Australian band to learn how to play proper rock songs, or more so, how to play rock guitar. What was your initial reaction to hearing ACDC for the first time? You know, hearing ACDC for the first time... Uh, I just really liked the fact that it just sounded like real people playing. Just it, I had seen so many of my dad's shows and I was aware of, of what it takes to, to, to do a, a really strong live performance. And uh, it, the energy in a live show is very different than the energy of recording something in the studio. But they... They seem to transcend all of that because you know, uh, they really play live in the studio. <laughs> uh, but they're really just a band, and that's what they do. They, they just play, and they have a sound when they play together. Um, but one of the things I loved, um, there's a, a song, perhaps one of the little-known songs of ACDC, but the song Squealer, you know that one? Yes. Yeah, that one has one of the craziest uh, pinch harmonic solo it, there's it's something you can do with a, a guitar pick when you're hitting the string when you're holding the pick if the trailing edge of your thumb hits the string after the pick it'll produce a false harmonic and uh some people are really well known for for using that effect you know eddie van halen sure did it quite a bit but angus periodically did it uh but on that song it's it's something that you can do, but you can't always control what the outcome is. So he got this amazing harmonic out of that that time, and I don't think you could duplicate it because it's just really really cool. All these years later, that's um, still one of my favorite solos of his. So one of my greatest early MTV memories, and I still have this on video somewhere, goes back to when J.J. Jackson, one of the original five VJs on MTV, who was by far the most knowledgeable of the bunch, actually told viewers to go back and check out Angus Young solo on Squealer and that he was, quote, brilliant on it. So all this time, I selfishly thought that I was the only one who knew but at that moment, everything was vindicated. And now again, Dweezil, I love that you just said Squealer was your favorite solo. So you heard it here first, folks. Go back and check out Angus Young's best guitar solo of all time, Squealer off Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. You will not be disappointed. Your father's made some of the most diverse music in rock. On the other hand, ACDC's carved out a massive career playing essentially one style of music that's changed very little over the years. That's what people love, that consistency. They're rock solid and they have a great sound. Yeah, well, the, they have a sound. And the coolest thing about them, if you look at their whole career, is that the way they go about recording their records is they pretty much just set up in a room that sounds good and then they just play. It's not studio trickery. It's not massive amounts of overdubs. It's mm -mm. 
let's go in there, let's use the right mics, let's just make it sound like what we sound like. Right. And a lot of bands aren't capable of that because most bands don't sound good live to begin with. But <laughs> they are the band that they just, they have a sound and it sounds best when they're just, you know, doing what they do. And, and they've never strayed from that. They never went off and did like a, you know, a power ballad or something, you know. So some people may say, oh, well, you know, they never, they never tried to grow or they never matured. I don't think it matters. I think they've done exactly what they're good at and they've done it well every time out. I mean, it's hard to, to do what they do. You know, they make it sound easy, but, you know, to play it that tight and, and play it with the right attitude and energy is what makes them so special. Do you hear those early influences that Angus draws upon? B.B. King, Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, Freddie King, John Lee Hooker. Well, you can hear it, uh, particularly in Angus's lead playing. I mean, uh, the way he favors certain uh, phrases within a blues idiom uh, is similar to B.B. King. Uh, he's very uh, melodic and very uh, lyrical with his, uh, with his playing. But then he'll also throw in some, some really speedy little licks as well that those other players uh, couldn't do. Right. You know? So uh, that's him giving a nod to what, what he likes, but doing his own thing with it uh, as well. Um, but, I mean, that's pretty much how music works. You, know? uh, you can't help but be inspired by certain things. Uh, that, that you hear and, and some, sometimes it just comes out in, in, in what you do. I mean, there's, there's a million kids that want to pick up the guitar and, and learn how to play Back in Black. And I guarantee you that 99% uh, of them will learn it wrong, but still think they're playing it just like Angus. <laughs> right. Let's talk a little bit about your wonderfully whimsical career. I referenced MTV earlier where you've actually been an MTV VJ at one point. You've done voiceover work for the 1990s animated show Duckman and others. You've appeared on and composed music for television. You've had roles in films like Jack Frost, The Running Man, Pretty in Pink. You've even had a cooking show. But musically, you've developed a, a really strong affinity for playing the guitar, which is your true love. You were able to learn directly from Eddie Van Halen and Steve Vai, who was at one time a guitar player in your father's band, and you become a monster guitar player in your own right, which we'll get into a little bit later. But one of my favorite parts of your timeline is the laundry list of interesting guest appearances you've made on other people's records, including Don Johnson, Winger, Spinal Tap, Weird Al, and even Pat Boone. Pat Boone, he loves the heavy metal. You played on that album with him, right? I did. I played on his uh, heavy metal album. It was big band version of, of heavy metal classics, but I played on Smoke on the Water. And the thing that was funny about that was, obviously the song is about an incident uh, involving my father where the casino uh, in uh, Montreux, Switzerland, uh, burned down because somebody shot a flare gun into the ceiling right. and it was an all wooden building and it burned down all the equipment was lost and all this stuff and um so you know it was kind of uh, fitting that i would play on that song but i also used a guitar that was originally played by Jimi hendrix and then burned and then given to my dad <laughs> so it's kind of like wow. all of these things all in that's amazing i totally forgot frank is uh, mentioned in that song um, and on that record, Pat covered ACDC's It's a Long Way to the Top. What, what did you think of his version? I mean, I think Pat Boone is, uh, is pretty funny. Uh, he's a nice guy. Uh, and in the era that he first came up in, uh, you know, for that s style of crooning and, and everything, he, he is, uh, he's a musician from a, a different era. But then when he puts this other stuff together, this is an ironic sense of humor uh, to it and and it takes some guts to to do it because I mean he got in trouble with all of his church groups and everything <laughs> right. for for doing right. that probably you know the ACDC song uh, uh, you know just the affiliation of anything ACDC probably really uh, scared a lot of people because uh, you know a highway to hell and all that sure. kind of stuff so sure. I mean 
I give him credit for uh, having a sense of humor and 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 continuing on with the, something like that. Anyway, but you know, it's uh, it's amusing to hear those songs arranged that way for sure. Yeah, what's your feeling about covering a band like ACDC? Have you heard a rendition that you actually like? I haven't heard a lot of bands cover. Uh, ACDC, to be honest, uh, I've, I've seen certain things, uh, live performances on TV where people will say, oh, yeah, we can just do this ACDC tune and do Back in Black or something, play it wrong, don't play the guitar solo right. See, to me, it's, a, uh, it's annoying. If you're going to cover a band like ACDC and it's so guitar-oriented, at least play the riff right with the right notes and the right rhythm and at least give a nod to the lead. Like, play the themes that Angus sets up, you know, if not, learn it note for note, if you can, you know. <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, it, to me, if you're going to cover, uh, you know, anything rock like that, Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, or whatever, don't bother to change the guitar stuff. It's not like you're going to make it better, you know. <laughs> Play it like they did. That's, uh, that's what I would do. We've spoken to everyone from Big and Rich to Anthrax to Living Color, and even two cellos, and you have artists like Billy Joel and Bruce Springsteen, Maroon 5, uh, Nora Jones, all covering ACDC. How does this band have such a crossover appeal like that? Well, I think what they have is uh, it's, it's not a gimmick. I mean, they have uh, a real love for blues music, and blues and rock are a great combination, and you can make a connection to that. There's a certain power and a soulful uh, quality that is in there, in the guitar playing, in the singing, the, the whole thing. So the other thing that they do is, uh, for lack of a better term, they, they, they micro-encapsulate these riffs. They make these things such a powerhouse that even the most moronic person in the most socially retarded area can listen to it and go, I get it. I like it. You know? So it's not that they're dumbing down what they're capable of, but no. they just have this ability to take something simple, but just give it so much power. And, uh, and they do that over and over again. And that's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. They're, they're a freight train when they play that stuff. And, uh, and the riffs are just so so memorable, and they're so much fun to play that it's it's easy to see why someone would be inspired by hearing one of their songs to say, "I want to play guitar because of that." Yeah, well said, Dweezil. Well said. I'm gonna jump uh, topics here for a minute because I, I wanted to bring this up. Um, your father played an instrumental role during the PMRC music censorship hearing in the mid eighties. I remember watching those hearings and being so impressed with how passionate and eloquent your father was to protect our country's freedom of speech. Yeah, there's, there's some, there's some, um, pretty good quotes. Uh, his whole, uh, his whole presentation that he made is, um, is available for people to read the whole transcript, but, uh, he talks about it in his book, The Real Frank Zappa Book, too. One of my favorite quotes was uh, it, he started his whole uh, opening thing by saying the way that they were dealing with the, the issue was by treating dandruff, or uh, it was like treating dandruff by decapitation. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there, what it all came down to uh, was there was a special tape tax that they were uh, pushing through. Uh, so people uh, were getting, or it was really for, uh, ended up being for CDs as well, it, to get, for record companies to get a percentage of the, uh, the revenue from blank CDs and just blank media stock, you know, tape. And, and so all this was just a disguise for some other thing to pass. Well, even more impressive that Frank wasn't even on PMRC's Filthy 15 list of songs, but ACDC was. And here he is showing up defending uh, all his fellow musicians. Uh, I don't remember which song they were down for, but I, there, was, there were other songs that... Um, <clears throat> it was just hilarious to hear these senators uh, reciting lyrics to bands that no one had ever heard of, like this one band, The Mentors, uh, they had a song called Shit Tower. And, you know, the, so they're sitting there and they're reading these lyrics. And I was like, this is horrible. 
knowing full well the FCC would never allow it to be on the radio. It's never being played on the radio. <laughs> You know, it might have uh, gone completely unnoticed until they started talking about it. Right, know? right. So I think it's safe to say Frank Zappa definitely saw the humor in music. Do you think he saw the humor in ACDC when he first saw them in Australia and tried to sign them simply because he was amused by the whole Angus Young schoolboy thing or the tongue-in-cheek songs? Well, I think the thing is, uh, I never think of ACDC as being like a funny band. You know, they, they have a, a sense of humor in some of their songs, but it's, it's more like a party atmosphere and it's, it's like a fun thing and they have a lot of energy, but I don't think they set out to be comedians. You know, I think they, they just said, you know, let's go rock. Mm -hmm. And I think my dad probably had a similar opinion. Uh, you know, the schoolboy thing, uh, certainly something that uh, is an obvious attention getting thing and it works and it's, it's good. Um, but it doesn't, at all overshadow the music. The music is the thing that makes them stand out and, and makes them uh, have this uh, longevity in, in their career. It's not because, you know, people say, oh, I can't get enough of seeing that schoolboy uniform. You know, <laughs> they want to hear the SG, man. Right. So Angus Young and Frank Zappa, two guitarists who were obviously a huge inspiration on your playing, but those two guys have a very specific approach to playing. Very simplistic and extremely sophisticated, but both with extreme raw energy. I always love seeing your dad wield that cherry red Gibson SG. Did you ever play his Gibson to see if you could emulate that Angus Young sound? Well, my dad had some Gibson guitars around you know, the house, SGs, and he was pretty much uh, the only other player other than Angus that uh, was pretty synonymous for playing an SG. Right. And... Uh, but the funny thing was, when I would look at pictures of Angus, I was like, where does he get those big SGs? Those are really cool, <laughs> you know? And then I, I didn't realize that, uh, that they were the normal size SGs. Right. You know? uh, but it just looked big when he was uh, playing it. I don't know why, but, you know, it, <laughs> so the, the thing was, <laughs> when I finally um, got a chance to, uh, to, to watch him play up close when I, we did that recording, that was one of the coolest things. You know, whenever you get a chance to see uh, a very iconic player, somebody who's really known for doing something that's very much their own thing and they do it well, it's just fascinating to, to watch them go about it. You know, to him, he'd probably say, well, it's no, nothing special. But to so many other people, they're in awe of the way that he does it. I mean, just the way he attacks the strings and the vibrato and the whole thing you know it's just a sound it's it, it's all in his hands he doesn't use effects you know you never hear him no. using delays or flangers no or pedals. anything i mean it's just like raw power so dweezil i'm glad you mentioned getting to see angus young play up close and 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 that's a good segue for what i wanted to get into um since the early 90s you've been working on a piece of music named what the hell was i thinking it's an hour and a half piece of music featuring guitar solos by dozens of famous players including eddie van halen steve vai joe walsh eric johnson Ingve malmsteen and, and on and on but most impressively to this audience angus and malcolm young yeah i uh I was making a record and I got this idea to, to make an instrumental that uh, first started off um, randomly. I was going to make a song that was 22 minutes long. It just said, okay, I'm going to just like the number 22. I'm going to make a song that's 22 minutes long. I'm going to make it have all these different parts and maybe I'll invite some people to play on it. So I started putting it together and it was interesting. And then when it got, you know, to around 22 minutes, I was thinking, well, I have all these other ideas. Maybe I'll add some more things. And then it turned into, all right, now I'll make it the entire length of a CD, 75 minutes, a continuous piece of music that's constantly changing and morphing from one thing to another, uh, sonically and musically. Uh, but uh, when it started off in the, in the early years when I was um, working on it a lot, it was an interesting period of music because guitar playing uh, used to be really popular and then it was going on this really swift decline. And as I continued to work on this thing, it, it became apparent that even if I finished it and it had all these people on it, 
no one would ever care because no one likes guitar playing anymore. You know, it, it was this period of time after the whole grunge thing when it was like, if you're good at guitar, you're out of a job. You know, if you can totally uh, only just make noise and barely play three chords, you're a genius. You know, if you got the right tattoos on your face and uh, some stupid, uh, you know, pogo bouncing move while you play, uh, you're in. You know, all that stuff um, sort of started to go away, and now now people are being interested in musicianship and guitar playing. It's coming back, so now I kind of have a reason to finish it, but. So this has become your own Chinese democracy in a sense. Yeah, in, in a way, you know. Uh, so, uh, long story short, some of the people that are that are on it, uh, you know, are pretty well known. Anywhere from Eddie Van Halen to Brian May, Eric Johnson, wow. and Angus and Malcolm Young. And now, to my knowledge, I, I've never seen or heard of them playing on any other record other than ACDC, except for this one. And yeah. what's funny about it is. It pretty much just sounds like ACDC because, uh, you know, the two of them together, no matter what they do, are always going to sound like ACDC. Sure. And the, the thing that was cool was I, I, I set it up so Angus could play uh, a couple of different takes of solos. And every solo he did was different, but every solo was perfect in its execution in terms of building uh, and doing something... Uh, it was very much, you know, Angus's thing, but they were all complete ideas. He, he never, like, fumbled and, and said, oh, well, let's, you know, do... It was all complete takes, and, you know, there was one that stood out over the others, but they were all good. Uh, and so that was different than a lot of other players that uh, had already come in and played. Uh, the, you know, most of the people, even as good as they were, would punch in multiple times. Wow. But, you know, here he was, he comes in, plays six things, he's done. You know, from my uh, listening to his records, I know he has uh, quite a bit of skill, but it was, it was funny to me that uh, at, during that session, um, he seemed to uh, say, well, I don't really even know how to tune my guitar. I usually tell Malcolm to tune my guitar. And, uh, but at least the energy of what, what that is, uh, is is what he goes for. And he's always had a really great tone. It's not over the top with saturated distortion it's 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 just like power amp hitting the heart you know hitting the guitar hard and just all finger tone you know both angus and malcolm they just they just do what they do and it, it's it sounds like it does because that's their innate sensibility and their their skill to to do that they just they do what they do and they do it well well said. Now, how did you go about acquiring the Young Brothers, not known for being that easily accessible or, like you said, down for being associated with anything outside of ACDC? I mean, their brother George may have put Angus and Mal on some early Australian recordings for bands that he was producing at the time, but this seems like you accomplished the impossible. It, it was just a, a sort of fortuitous thing. I was doing this... Um thing in Europe I was hosting something on MTV Europe and um, I can't remember the exact circumstances but we had a segment where Angus uh, was a live call-in to the show uh, and I was talking to him about some stuff that he was doing and and then after the the segment was over I had asked him if he would be interested in playing on this this thing and he said yeah you know I'll be in LA at, uh, in a couple of months or whatever it turned out to be and you know so he was there and his, his brother was there and um, you know since he was in the studio you couldn't you couldn't not have him play I mean right. he was like yeah you got to play in this too so yeah just put put them in the studio together Amazing. and uh, and they they played on on this thing but they were just nice enough to say yeah we'll we'll do it uh, and it just uh, I, I had never spoken to him before uh, I had no contact with him before that, we did that uh, that session. They were really cool, really nice, and and um, the fact that they they did it, you know, to me, it's it's just it's always going to be a great memory uh, because part of the, making this record is was a little bit of guitar espionage. I got to see the best players, the people that inspired me the most, up close, how they did what they did, what gear they used, and. And you know, just their thought process while they're recording and while they're playing, and 
and and that kind of stuff is is just really cool i mean in a way it's kind of like um anthropology you know i mean you, you yeah. if you're going to take it uh if you looked at this years later and you you, you took it apart and <clears throat> i mean for me i have the experience of seeing how they did it but it would be like the same thing of you know how did they build the pyramids well they took all these things they had a lot of people working and they stacked this stuff up and they built it you know but you know as far as guitar i had all these different guys i saw what they use how they do it w the way they were thinking uh and so just cool. what their their general level of awareness of of what they do and how they do it and it, it helps you become a better musician you know because you see the kinds of things that that they do like like i said angus six complete takes no mistakes wow you know that that's that's unusual so how do how long did that session last was it what was it like? Can you describe that to us? I mean, it, when they when they got there, uh, it just took a few minutes to set up their gear, and then uh, the tape was ready to go. And it wasn't uh, it, it, it wasn't that difficult a, a piece for for them to play, you know, rhythmically. And then uh, it was just a solo for Angus in the key of B. But I did make him start off the section by doing a little bit of that. Uh, finger picking thing that he does that's at the beginning of for those about to rock nice so. nice now i'd like the folks at home to know that dweezil did in fact open the vaults for greg and me to be able to listen to angus and malcolm's playing together on this song we promised to actually shut the tape recorder down and listen to it and it, we literally melted right there on the spot. It sounded so good. It actually brought me back to being 15 years old again. Um, so powerful. Quite frankly, it sounded like a new ACDC album. And so thanks so much for the sneak peek. And hopefully fans will be able to hear that in its entirety one day. What else did you guys talk about or learn from Angus and Malcolm during this brief session? Yeah, they were in the studio and we talked about a few things. I think they were in the middle of a, a buying trip too, they were buying a bunch of Marshall amplifiers and stuff. So they had just um, got six or eight different uh, old Marshall heads. Um, and uh, so, I mean, the thing about uh, the sound that they get, they just, they do everything super old school. You know, they, it's just all about using the right piece of equipment, but keeping it simple. And that's why they have a powerful sound. It's not a lot of um, massive gain in, in what they do. And uh, uh, there's, there's definitely some volume, but <laughs> it's not uh, a lot of preamp fizzy distortion. You know, it's, it's just power amp crushing, you know. <laughs> it's just uh, the way they go about it is the exact right way to do it, you know. Man, I would have loved to have been, pardon the phrase, a fly on the wall during that session. I think about other great fans of the band like Stephen King, who, by the way, we've been extremely unsuccessful in landing an interview with, but desperately want him on our show. We'll just keep trying. Um, who also coerced ACDC into producing new music for his Maximum Overdrive soundtrack. Again, um, how do you think he was able to get that band in the studio? Well, you know, the funny thing was um, when in that era, it was early MTV. Um, and I think that using rock music in that way uh, to promote a film was uh, uh, fairly uncommon. Uh, and the fact that Stephen King was such a rock guy, you know, I was like, all right, he likes The Rock, I'm gonna see that movie, you know, because, you know, it's cool. It's easy to associate with people if you feel like you're, you know, you have something in common. We like to say that ACDC Beyond the Thunder is less about the band and more about how notable individuals like yourself have been influenced in a way that has inspired even altered lives through the power of music and discussing that common bond that we all share. Not always easy to put into words. How does a band like ACDC transcend music in your mind? You know, it's weird. There, there probably are a lot of situations where music can, uh, can be important uh, and, and transcend the situation, but uh, for a band 
that has, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, a brand name that's so well known, um, uh, to have the diverse groups of people that, that like them, that you wouldn't expect would like them, uh, that, that's, that's fairly unusual. Uh, but it makes all the sense in the world if you just are going based on the visceral gut reaction of, of what they do. It's, you can't deny that they're good at what they do. So if you're a reasonable person who judges things based on skill, you have to look at that and say, what they're doing and the way they're doing it, they're the best at what they do. Yeah. You know? and, and they just have a sound that you can't recreate. I mean, there's a lot of cover bands and they do a fine job, but it's still not the same thing. No. Dweezil, you mentioned uh, ACDC being a brand, which they are. They've become a massive brand. How does it make you feel when you go into places like Walmart and you can see, you know, countless T-shirts and boxers and, and uh, beer and what have you uh, with an ACDC logo on it? Well, you know, in this day and age, uh, uh, people just want to go to one place and get as much shopping done as they possibly can. You know, they want to buy their ACDC, they want to buy their steaks and some ammo, you know, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> In 2006, you organized the Zappa Play Zappa Tour and assembled an incredible band of young musicians with a view to bring the music of Frank Zappa, your father, to a younger audience. The tour also featured guest appearances from Frank's original band and has gone on to tour the world under different monikers while still carrying that Zappa torch. Tell us a little bit about this chapter in your life. Uh, well, Zappa Play Zappa is, um, is really just, you know, it's been a labor of love for me to, 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 to focus so hard on my, my father's music and, and uh, just try to get people that would otherwise not have any experience with the music at all to, to, to have the opportunity to see it in a live situation younger generations that, that would never get the chance to see him play live um, really get a kick out of seeing this music uh, played because it's so challenging. We really have focused on learning a lot of the hardest stuff, some of his classical uh, compositions, and part of what I try to do with it uh, is, is really, I guess, I feel like He's been misunderstood by, by people for a long time because of the way he's been represented uh, by the media. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think, oh, he's just the guy with the songs with the crazy names and the kids with the crazy names, but they don't really know that much about his music. They might know songs like Don't Eat the Yellow Snow. Mm -hmm. They might know Peaches on Regalia. They might know some of the songs that have a sense of humor to them, um, but that's not the majority of the over 80 albums that he made. So... I wanted to give people a, a greater sense of, of his music and so we play stuff from every different era and we try to make concerts that uh, even the, the biggest fans might not be familiar with everything that's in the show that we do. You know? So we try to really um, play a lot of different things that, um, that display his, his prowess as a uh, composer and as a guitar player, as opposed to just the things that you would come to expect. And uh, so it really takes a lot of time and effort to, to learn that stuff. Great reviews from diehard fans and new fans, and even a Grammy nomination. Congratulations. That's quite a vindication within the industry as well. A lot of people think of Zappa Play Zappa as just a cover band or a tribute band of some sort. But I'm not aware of too many tribute bands that get Grammy nominations. So hmm. there's something that is being recognized uh, that, first of all, the music is certainly uh, uh, worthy of recognition, but the fact that we've put so much attention to detail into it and, uh, and are, are really trying to just serve the music uh, and make sure people get a chance to hear it, future generations. You know? So I think that's, that's why people... Um, people like the way that we go about it. Um, yeah, I think it's respectful, it's smart, it's such a cool thing that you're doing, it feels right, 
And ACDC had such great respect for your father's musicianship and the Zappa name. And I don't know what Steve Vai or Eddie Van Halen taught you, but your guitar playing is simply on another level. In fact, I implore listeners to check out a YouTube clip that I posted of Dweezil playing Van Halen's Eruption in my hometown of Raleigh, in which you tell the audience this great backstory alongside an equally great rendition of that solo. You will not be disappointed. Now knowing that your chops are as good as, if not better than Frank's, how hard is it playing Frank Zappa's challenging arrangements live night after night? It's a real challenge, but we have a lot of fun fun doing it, and, and the, the people, uh, the younger generation that have come to know the music through um, what we're doing, you know, it's, it's great because uh, as we were talking about people doing cover songs uh, earlier, uh, I was saying, you know, at least if you're going to record the song and it has specific musical elements, don't change them. Play them the way they're supposed to be played. So that's what we do with, we, you know, in Frank's music, most of it is written out. So uh, we, have, we have charts, but we have the recordings that we go to and we transcribe things that we don't have charts for. And we, we are very accurate with what we do. So we're literally playing the stuff the way he wanted it played. So it's a version that's either on a recording or from a live uh, version. And we don't change it, you know, other than when we're doing solos and things that are meant to be improvised, but we yeah. don't change the music at all. And so there's, there's really no point in doing that. I, mean, I want people to hear it the way he intended it to be heard. And if they like it when, when we play it, then they should listen to his records and, and explore uh, what he, I mean, there's over 80 albums. That's an insane amount of work in, in 30 some odd years. So, uh, amazing. Yeah. I mean, what's really crazy is some of the stuff that we're playing and it still sounds like nothing you would ever hear on the radio. And that's the thing that's so shocking is that the music that, uh, he's recorded, it's, it's beyond something that you could call timeless. It, it's, it's still so far ahead of its time. That's what's so, so weird. Dweezil, thanks again for allowing us to be here in this very hallowed studio. Congrats on all of your success carrying on the Zappa family torch to fans around the world and for sharing your ACDC stories with us, not to mention a very top secret ACDC track with Angus and Malcolm Young. Hopefully will be released in the future. But we leave you with our final perfunctory question, which is, more important than the meaning of life. If you had to describe ACDC in one word, what would it be? Hmm. Uh, energy. ACDC Beyond the Thunder theme song, Trailer Trash, written and performed by Gannon Arnold. VO Talent by Bruce Jacobson. Cinematography and sound recording by Greg Ferguson. Edited and mixed by Eric Keel. Brand ambassador and marketing guru, Gino Bona. Written, directed, and hosted by Kurt Squires. Produced by Gino Bona, Greg Ferguson, Eric Kielb, and Kurt Squires. ACDC Beyond the Thunder is a Squires LLC current motion production. Copyright Beyond the Thunder podcast, all rights reserved. This has been a Nat Attack presentation. Shazbot. Nanu, nanu.